This presentation shows manifestations of the MP problem in different natural domains before elaborating on the relation between form and meaning in natural language and mathematical logics. A discovery is then revealed and leads to the solution method described in detail in the publication. The MP problem is actually one phenomenon expressed in different forms. Many practically important problems seem to require brute force processing, searching for a solution by trying all possible combinations of input variable values. Some very known problems are circuit set, traveling salesman, cake leaks, knapsack, and set. Take a Boolean circuit with a single output node and ask whether there is an assignment of values to the circuit's inputs so that the output is 1. For each two cities, an integer cost is given to travel from one of the two cities to the other. The salesperson wants to make a minimum cost circuit visiting each city exactly once. A graph clique is a set of vertices such that they all connect to each other. A K clique is a set of K nodes with all possible edges connected between them. The question is, given a graph and a K, does the graph contain a K clique? Given S and W, can we translate a subset of rectangles to have their bottom edges on L so that the total area of the rectangles touching L is at least W? There are actually thousands of NP-complete problems. Some of them can be categorized in packing problems, covering problems, constraint satisfaction problems, sequencing problems, partitioning problems, and numerical problems. As you can see, the satisfiability problem is the core of the class NP and plays a vital role since every other problem can be reduced to it. Satisfiability of a mathematical logical formula has been always the main concern of logic since Aristotle. Its core is to try to know the truth value of a logical sentence using formal transformations as much as possible. Let us look at this problem from the natural language processing angle. We will focus on so-called lexical functional grammars. LFGs are used to recognize sentences of natural language, like English, by differentiating between two levels of information called C and F structure. A C structure represents surface grammatical configurations, such as word order. An F structure represents abstract syntactic functions, such as subject, object, predicate, and so on. For the sentence John saw Mary, for example, those two structures are constructed using a lexicon of English language which stores meanings and roles of different words. How does this work? Take the sentence the beer ate a sandwich, for example. Starting from a constituent structure tree, grammatical encoding tells you how to find the subject. The beer is the subject. Lexical mapping tells you what semantic role the subject has. This is because the verb eat, as well as its parameters, agent and patient, are all stored in the lexicon. So, the subject is the agent. Therefore, the beer is the agent. Note that in order to get the right C structure for the sentence, we need to be able to distinguish at least noun phrases, from verb phrases and compare their sequences with some stored grammatical information we have. This usually results in many cumbersome trees looking like this one. LFG language recognition is NP hard. The reduction is from 3Z. Let us take a look at the reason. It's of course ambiguity. 
Here are some snapshots of the paper from 1982. Intriguingly though, when one examines the proof to be given below, the ability to express co-occurrence constraints over arbitrary distances across terminal tokens in a string, as in subject-verb number agreement, when coupled with the possibility of alternative lexical entries, seems to be all that is required to make the recognition of LFG languages intractable. Let's try to understand what Mr. Berwick is trying to say in plain English. First terminology. Co-occurrence constraints are rules like requiring the subject and the verb in a sentence to be both either singular or plural. Terminal tokens in a string are just English words used in the sentence. So Mr. Berwick is saying that in any sentence we probably need to try many entries in the lexicon for the same word and check for each one of them co-occurrence constraints to be able to get even close to the actual meaning. One and the same terminal item can have two distinct lexical entries corresponding to distinct lexical categorizations. For example, baby can be both a noun and a verb. If we had picked baby to be a verb and hence had adopted whatever features are associated with the verb entry for baby to be propagated up the tree, then the string that was previously well formed, the baby is kissing John, would now be considered deviant. If a string is ill-formed under all possible derivation trees and assignments of features from possible lexical categorizations, then that string is not in the language generated by the LFG. The ability to have multiple derivation trees and lexical categorizations for one and the same terminal item plays a crucial role in the reduction proof. It is intended to capture the satisfiability problem of deciding whether to give an atom xi a value of t or f. So let us resume what we have just found for the LFG case. First, ambiguity is already on the word level, and it seems to be an intrinsic property of language and or all languages. This is the main reason for presumable intractability. But what if the word level was not ambiguous in a certain language? What will happen then? First, NP-hardness proof will not work. Second, this means also that we may get efficient recognition in that language. It does not mean that we can show P is equal to NP unless recognition in that language is equivalent to recognition in LFG, of course. But the question is, do we have such a language? Is there any such language? If we ask such a general question, the answer will be no, of course. But there are ones, mostly unstudied in this context, which are very close to that. Welcome to the realm of Arabic. The Arabic sentence to the left is a verse from the great Quran which says وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ But over all endued with knowledge is one the all-knowing. The Arabic sentence to the right is the way people communicate such phrases nowadays. They omit all signs which theoretically should be there. What are those signs? You should think of them like a background melody which moves pronunciations of characters up and down, making them shorter or longer as instructed by the signs. It is not surprising that such signs are called harakat, which literally means motions. When motions are written, they are called tashkil. So how does this relate to ambiguity? Harakat or tashkil are actually used in a procedure called I'rab. I'rab is an Arabic term for the process of putting the system of nominal, adjectival, or verbal suffixes of classical Arabic in action. These suffixes are written in fully vocalized Arabic texts. I'rab means literally disambiguation and uses the same stem as the word Arab. 
Its purpose is to clarify meanings of phrases by letting harakat indicate syntactic functions. Let's give an example. In the sentence, ذهب الولد إلى المدرسة, the boy went to school, a parza may immediately distinguish verb from noun without even going to the lexicon using a set of syntactical indicators, including but not restricted to al, which is a determinant used only for nouns. This sign called kasra, and it is also a haraka used only for nouns. A parza may recognize syntactic functions as well. So boy is here subject because of this small sign called dhamma on the word al-walad. Subjects in Arabic sentences are usually vocalized with dhamma. Let's see how lexica of classical Arabic are organized. They are actually organized around word roots and their patterns, which are called awzan. Awzan are occurrences of roots within words determining the lexical category and giving meaning nuances. All entries in an Arabic lexicon must use harakat. One and the same vocalized terminal item can have therefore only one categorization. There are of course statistically negligible exception cases. An example for the root n, s, r is provided here. You can see even without understanding Arabic scripts that entries for vocalized words differ in lexical categories although they are looking the same without tashkil. Let us give a practical example of how tashkil may be used coupled with a grammar. We see here a simplistic classical Arabic grammar which has the unique feature of enabling the critics or tashkil to be used with terminals, non-terminals, as well as in the production rules of the grammar. Note that words or awzan of the lexicon form also a part of this grammar. Suppose we have now the sentence رَأْيُ الْوَلَدِ خَيْرُ رَأْيٍ The boy's opinion is the best opinion. After an initial step in which the lexicon is searched for those words, we get the pattern IND for indefinite, DEF for definite, IND and IND. We shall see now how Tashkil can guide the production process. We start with the first sub-pattern in our sentence, which contains a Tashkil which appears also in a production rule. Here, DEF with Kasra. Production 6 is the only one containing such pattern, so we use it to complete the right part of the sentence by finding out that DF kasra ind is genitive as per production 6. Production 5 tells us that genitive is a form of def as well. A production 4, we can also see that it might be a noun with dhamma. It might also be as per production 10, an assertion. Recall that a noun phrase constitutes of a noun plus dhamma and an assertion in this order from right to left as per production 2. For the left part of this sentence, we also start with the only production containing this form of tashkil, which is a special form of kasra, and find out that it is also used only in production 6. We complete the left part as we have done before. Notice that we must only try four different trials until we reach the structure of the noun phrase as per production 2. Let's try now to omit all use of tashkil and see what happens. Because we have assertions 4 and 10 which may classify the words in the sentence we have here as either noun or assertion, we get additional 16 possibilities on top of the already discussed ones, which is an important drawback of course. 
So let's imagine an oversimplified Arab-based classical Arabic language recognition procedure, C-A-L-R-P. It may look like this. For each word in the sentence, first, use syntactical indicators to determine category and type, noun, verb, definite, indefinite, and so on. Second step, Use the lexicon to verify your decision by matching the input word with patterns stored there. Third step, if steps 1 and 2 fail, the word and thus the sentence is not a classical Arabic one. In a next loop, for each word type deduced, use haraka on the end of the word to determine the eligible production or productions in the diagrammer. Then, if there is no haraka or the given one does not match any production, don't accept the sentence. If there are matching productions, apply them not only to the current word, but also to previous or later ones if necessary, and give priority to productions which cover more words in the type sentence. If you reach noun phrase or verb phrase, accept the sentence, else reject. Why did I say oversimplified? Well, because there are always morphological and grammatical transformation rules which may apply to words revealing either the correct roots or the correct haraka or both. There are also co-occurrence constraints between sentence constituents as we have seen. Remember, CALRP works only for fully vocalized Arabic text. Since vocalized terminal items, i.e. words with tashkil, are in general not ambiguous, a correct sentence may be efficiently recognizable using the lexicon and the diagrammer without the need for extensive trials. We can safely conjecture that CALRP is efficient. Remember that the NP-hardness proof works only when there is ambiguity in the lexical category of a terminal item. But this is not enough to show that P is equal to NP, as we said before. Why? Because we would have to show that the grammar expressing classical Arabic is as powerful as the LFG, which is a difficult task. So what to do? Is it maybe possible to find syntactic meaning indicators in other languages too? Maybe English? This sounds to be a very crazy idea, but not as crazy as searching for meaning indicators in languages of logics. So, I just ask myself the question, do languages of logics possess such indicators bridging the gap between form and meaning? And this last thought was and is a turning point indeed. So let's resume my research motivation. Classical Arabic sentences possess natural melodies on top of each character, called harakat or tashkil, bridging the gap between form and meaning. Can I maybe find similar melodies in logical formulas? This would be a discovery then, not an invention. Tashkil was not invented, but discovered in the way ancient Arabs communicated. What are melodies? They are actually natural patterns. So, I need to find an undiscovered source of patterns in the mathematical logical formula. But, logical formulas are actually very simple. You either have operations between input variables, or you have input variables themselves. Either one of those two sources is the one I'm seeking. The satisfiability problem is expressed in a language which has form and meaning. The form is a sentence containing variables and logical connectors. The meaning is the well-known truth table, which is the ordered set of variable-value combinations. 
satisfiability of a formula S, which is equivalent to recognition in LFG, is actually finding a 1 in the last column to the right of this truth table. There are also other data structures which are equivalent to the truth table. One of them is this graph called a binary decision diagram. A binary decision diagram is produced through subsequent substitution of true and false for literals in the formula. Note that I have discarded all letters X from the formula and left the indices of variables only. For example, if we substitute 2 with true in the base formula, the clauses 1, 2, and 2, 3 evaluate to true, and we are only left with the clause 0, 4 to be resolved. The first important research question will be then, are there in the form of a closed set syntactical indicators, i.e. links to the truth table? And if yes, what are their roles? How do they contribute to the formation of the resolution tree? If we take a look at the procedure generating the BDD, let's call it uh, just PR, we will find out that there is actually a very simple way of doing this. First, you select any literal in the formula S, then you substitute true for this literal and form a new closed set, let's call it, for example, left closed set, then you substitute false for the same literal and form another new closed set, call it right closed set, then you call yourself recursively for both the left and then the right closed sets. The only two highlights of this procedure are actually the way you select any literal from the closed set S to be instantiated, and second, the fact that you should store in a certain data structure all the subformulas already done so that you don't do redundant work and you can search and find them when needed. Obviously, PR does not tell us which literal to choose first. It's actually left for the implementation of this procedure. Here are two implementations. To the left, I'm following the variable order 2, 1, 3, 0, 4, and getting five blue nodes. To the right, I'm following the order 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which I call canonical variable order, and getting 10 blue nodes. What is the reason for that? How do I find the best order? Is there any way to do that? Actually, finding an optimal order is NP-complete. And we come now to the second important research question. Is there a deeper reason why 21304 is better than 01234 for this S? One explanation attempt could be literal 2 appears more. But what about other literals? How to choose between them? Before revealing what I found out, let us make first an important observation. Observation 1. It is possible to change any ordering to a canonical one by renaming variables in the truth table. This is obvious, of course, since changing the names of variables in a truth table doesn't have any effect on the logics behind formulas. We could, for example, call x0 Ali or x1 Tom, and this has no effect on the formula S. In the previous example, renaming x2 to x0 and x3 to x2 and x0 to x3 makes the smaller tree achievable via canonical ordering. But then the close set will look like S prime x0, x1, x0, x2, x3, x4, which is equivalent via renaming to S. An important consequence of observation 1 is that we can focus our attention on the study of conditions under which a canonical ordering produces trees with small node counts instead of just searching in all ordering possibilities for suitable choices. This is why in my work, I mean in the introduction of the paper. Uh, I made the following conjecture. If during the resolution process in which PR recursively processes any 
CNF closed set S. First, it uses always canonical orderings to instantiate literals in S. And second, it makes sure S respects the conditions under which canonical ordering produce small trees, transforming S into an equivalent S prime if necessary. Then the tree produced by PR is small. In plain English, if we let PR always choose the least index in a closed set for the next instantiation, while the form of the closed set S respects the conditions under which canonical orderings produce small trees, then PR will be guaranteed to produce small trees as well. So the third and most important research question is the following. What are the conditions under which PR, using canonical orderings, produces small trees? Here comes now the most obvious discovery possible, which I have to call so because no one seems to be seeing it. Observation 2. Any variable xi represents in the canonical truth table a repetitive pattern of zeros and ones whose length is 2 to the power n minus i and which is given by the formula 2 to the power n minus i minus 1 zeros and then 2 to the power n minus i minus 1 ones, where n is the total number of variables. To fully appreciate this observation, a graph may be drawn in which the x-axis represents rows of a truth table and the y-axis boolean values given for a particular 2 sin f formula f. We call this graph pattern domain of f, pdf. Here you see pdfs of different subformulas of s, x2, x2, x3, and x0, x4. You can notice on the x-axis the row numbers, which go from 1 to 2 to the power n. We'll have to introduce here one small definition. A pattern length repetition of a variable v, abbreviated PLR of v, is the number of times a truth pattern of v is repeated within the 2 to the power n rows of the truth table. And we call the pattern length repetition of the variable with the least index in a clause C or a clause set S, the pattern length repetition of C or S. For example, PLR of X3 is 2 to the power 5 divided by the length of the pattern, which is 2 times 2 to the power 5 minus 3 minus 1, which is at the end 32 divided by 4, which is equal to 8. This pattern is repeating 8 times within the truth table. Can we explain blow-ups of trees using PDs? To do so, we need to focus on the effect of one single clause when it is resolved in an inductive step with an already produced tree. You see here two starting situations which lead to the same tree we saw before, which had 10 blue nodes. In the first starting situation, clause 0, 4 is missing, and in the second starting situation, clause 2, 3 is missing. Let's look more thoroughly at the first starting situation. If we draw the PD of closed set S double prime, we get this picture in which this piece of pattern is repeating twice. PD for X0, X4 looks like this. The pattern for variable X4 is dominating only in the portion of the graph where X0 is 0. The rest is 1 as you see. This is how the tree looks like after this step of resolution. You can notice now a very interesting thing. The tree has two very similar portions, one which corresponds to the fact that the pattern 1, 2, 2, 3 is resolved against the portion of the PD x0, x4, in which x0 is equal to 1, and the second corresponds to the effect of adding the pattern of variable x4 only to the PD of s double prime. 
In fact, if we forget the resolution tree, we could understand now very clearly, just by looking at the PD pictures to the left, that the pattern of S double prime needs to be resolved with different patterns more than one time. This means for our tree generation procedure that we need to copy subtrees constructed before at least one time. We call this copying process a split. We note now something very important that the PLR of the new clause X0, X4 is less than the PLR of the already constructed tree S double prime. Let's see what happens when we rename the formula S to become S prime, which we are seeing here, X0, X1, X0, X2, X3, X4. And we start with the first two clauses forming their PD, which looks like this for X0, X1, X0, X2. This PD should be resolved with the PD for X3, X4, which we see below here. This time we can draw the PD for the overall formula X0, X1, X0, X2, X3, X4 to see things more clearly. You can notice here that a certain small pattern is repeating again and again within the whole PD. How does this step look like in tree form? The new clause 3, 4 propagates down the tree of S Roman 4 and forms a sink. The sink corresponds to the pattern of 3, 4 and is reachable from both sides of the resulting tree. Take a look now on the PLRs of both the new clause X3, X4 and the already constructed subtree S Roman 4. You will find that PLR of X3, X4 is greater than PLR of S Roman 4. So let's resume our findings. We can indeed use the PDF to explain blow-ups in the number of nodes generated by sequential resolution procedures which use canonical orderings to produce resolution trees. It turns out that resolving a clause C with a clause set S where PLR of C is smaller than PLR of S necessitates split operations. Such operations are important causes of blow-ups. In the case of S prime, we have also seen that sequentially resolving clause sets S with a clause C does not include splits whenever PLR of this C is greater than the PLR of the S. We call this condition linear order. The core of our work is then formally showing that algorithms observing the LO condition always produce small trees. There is a subtle point which needs to be mentioned here. Some important Boolean functions, like multiplication for example, are known to possess exponentially sized BDDs. This appears to be contradicting the results of our work. A thorough investigation shows, however, that all known lower bounds relate to the intrinsic nature of those particular functions, which is disturbed when equisatisfiable versions of those functions are used in SAT solvers. The reason being that a large number of input variables are introduced in the equisatisfiable versions, which have no meaning for the original function. A special section in the paper is dedicated to explaining all this and should be read very carefully. We are ready now to answer our research questions. Question 1. Are there in the form of a closet syntactic indicators like those found in the Arabic language, i.e. links from CNF forms to meanings and truth tables? And if yes, what are their roles? How do they contribute to the resolution tree? The answer is yes. Indices used in variable names, as we have just seen, may be used to reflect PLRs. Their role is to help choose literals for instantiation such that no splits can occur. Research question 2. Is there a deeper reason why the order 21304 was better than 01234, the canonical one for S? 
The answer is yes, of course, because the canonical order generated a split. Research question three, what are the conditions under which PR using canonical orderings produces small trees? Only one condition is the answer, the LO condition. Please don't take my word here for that and go check the paper and convince yourself of all this. Let us sit back and understand now a little what we have done here. We just discovered that there are two different faces of a logical variable. The pattern face and what I call container face. The container face refers to the fact that in math you usually use a variable, not necessarily a logical variable, to store things only. You don't care about the nature of things you are storing except that they are of a certain type here boolean so you are basically storing any boolean values the word any means actually that we don't care how values of x2 may appear in reality they may be part for example of random sequences of values when we define algorithms manipulating those values, we call those algorithms universal when they respect this kind of abstraction. We are using here a sense of the word universal, which means that input variables are not restricted to a specific value of their given domains, but cover all values and which applies Tarski's ideas of separating variables from data originally conceived for mathematical logics. One important feature of universal algorithms is that the names of input variables are not holding any additional information. You could call them as you like, or exchange their names without any loss of generality. This is because this type of abstraction makes all variables of the same type indistinguishable. Note that this indistinguishable nature of input variables, i.e. that we don't care what to name them and the names don't hold for us any valuable or additional information, this nature is a prerequisite to universality. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to allow random variable sources. To see this, suppose we have two random variables whose values come in two colors, green or red. If we would like to name one of them after a distinct value which is expected to occur, such as the random variable which starts with green values and so on, we need to be able at least to predict the occurrence of such values. But true randomness does not allow such a prediction, of course. This contradicts what we have just found out, namely that logical variables like x2 always come as per truth table in patterns which can be expressed in mathematical formulas. The pattern of variable x2 is much different than the pattern of variable x0 or x100. And the difference is not only in the nature of the pattern itself, but also in its repetition factor or repetition length within the to the power n values of the truth table. So in reality, for every i and j, xi and xj are distinguishable. Their names hold for us the very important and distinct pattern information. How can we call this universal? Recall that in math, a truth table is not necessarily sorted. Input variable values may also be considered chaotic. But a sorted truth table, which is the object used in physical reality, does not cause any loss of generality and seems to be reflecting a very deep and basic way of human cognition. What I'm saying is that if we allow the use of sorted truth tables and in the same time stick to our definition of universal algorithms, we get an inconsistency. So as long as input variables of universal programs 
Stay in the realm of mathematics and mathematical objects. Everything is okay. But when we start to manipulate them in reality, our own bounded perception plays an important role and a contradiction appears. The contradiction is between, on the one side, our intention to keep algorithms as general as possible by allowing the most abstract notion of a variable in which we care only about its type and not about the nature of its source, thus allowing true random sources. And, on the other side, the fact that we will never be able to recognize such random sources even if they exist, and especially in finite domain applications like the application in which the SAT problem is defined. The contradiction is therefore between what people perceive as and what they define to be universal. Do you remember similar contradictions related to dual natures of things? Yes, of course. There is the famous wave-particle duality. Here is what Einstein once thought about it. It seems as though we must use sometimes the one theory and, and sometimes the other, while at times we may use either. We are faced with a new kind of difficulty. We have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explains the phenomena of light, but together they do. We will borrow now the ideas of Mr. Einstein and go visit the MP question once again. Obviously, most algorithms treat variables as containers and move them around, manipulate them, bounce them over and over again, in the aim to get the least possible number of trials. We will call from now on the object manipulated by such program describing a closed set the container expression of a closed set, CES. Obviously, all those algorithms are universal because they keep their input variables XI always indistinguishable. As mentioned, this type of universal solution attempts is the most seen in literature. On the other side, some people try to keep their solution attempts more or less related to the 2 to the power n possibilities of the truth table. We can picture this as if we are merging PDs of different portions of the closed set to form what we call from now on the pattern expression of S, PE of S. This effort uses universal algorithms as well. Here, variables are rows of the truth table, which are also treated as indistinguishable objects. So now we can understand the famous P is not equal to NP conjecture, which everyone seems to be believing in today, in the following way. For any CNF formula S, there are no efficient universal algorithms which can solve the satisfiability problem. I couldn't agree more. But are universal algorithms the only types of algorithms possible? Call an algorithm not admitting random input variables weakly universal, WU. Call WU algorithms using information from only one expression, either CE or PE of a closed set, single-sided. Call WE algorithms using information from both CE and PE expressions of a closed set pattern-oriented. Let's also define dual set of S as the question are there any subformulas S prime in the container expression of S satisfied by some common subpatterns of the pattern expression of S? It's time now to make my own conjectures based upon this new dual nature view of things. So, for any CNF formula S, I conjecture there are no efficient single-sided WU algorithms which can convert PES to CES or vice versa. I call this the conversion problem, abbreviated CONV.
if you think a little about it, you will find out that if a single-sided WU algorithm could ever succeed in efficiently transforming one face of a closed set to the other, it could also efficiently solve any set problem. And this is exactly what I'm expressing here in what I call the inefficiency principle, which is also a conjecture without proof. SAT and dual SAT can be efficiently solved by a single-sided WU algorithm if and only if CONV can be efficiently solved by such an algorithm. I hope you are already realizing the big difference between this conjecture and the consensus opinion of scientists that P is not equal to NP. The inefficiency principle looks much like the uncertainty principle known from physics, where it is conjectured also that you cannot measure both faces of a particle to an arbitrary precision in the same time. Position and momentum are called their complementary variables or faces. The inefficiency principle is essentially saying that the two faces of a closed set are also complementary in the sense that you need excessive and unpractical effort to change between them and that this is the real difficulty we are facing in the context of the NP problem. But this is only true, of course, if we are using single-sided WU algorithms in which both natures are not recognized. Which leads us to the main event of my work, and this time it's not a conjecture, but a theorem proven more than one time throughout the different publications until now, including this publication, of course, Theorem, Pattern-Oriented Algorithms, Building BDDs While Observing LO Conditions Imposed on CNF Closed Sets, Solve SAT Efficiently. Let's resume some facts before discussing the solution method. First, LFG language recognition is NP-hard. The reason is the ambiguity on the word level. Some languages like classical Arabic allow vocalizations to efficiently disambiguate meanings. Inspired by that, patterns in CNF formulas expressing SAT are sought and found to be hidden in variable indices, as we have seen. The BDD construction can be strongly influenced by variable patterns. We show in the paper that LO conditions always enable small resolution trees. This does not contradict lower bounds known for certain Boolean functions because our solver methods use equisatisfiable versions of those functions. If LO conditions are not met, closed sets are renamed such that a canonical order can be used to guide the instantiation of literals. All this results then in the practical algorithm of the next slide. Before going to the next slide, there is an important note though. We are showing here only the one main part of the solution of count to set, namely the construction of the FBDD. The other part is counting solutions in a graph, and this can be easily done using topological properties of DAGs as shown in the paper and as known in the literature. Finally, here it is, algorithm 2Z FGPRA, standing for Fast General Pattern Oriented Resolution Algorithm. You can see in the video the machine working closes off one by one, which is the version of the algorithm used in the paper for theoretical investigations. You can see how closed sets, which are not LO, are renamed and resolved again to fulfill the required pattern-oriented linear order condition for any closed set formed during the resolution process. So let's take a look on 2 that FGPRA, the practical algorithm. Its input is an arbitrary 2 CNF closed set S. Its output is an FBDD. First step is 
you need to translate S into a linearly ordered closed set S prime. And this you do using the renaming and sorting algorithm CRA plus given in the paper. The second step, you select the least literal X from the first clause in S prime. And this is what I call the least literal rule. Then you instantiate S prime using partial assignments. X is equal to true and X is equal to false, forming left and right closed sets S1 and S2 respectively. If either S1 or S2 are evaluated to true or false, form true-false nodes in the respective case. If neither S1 nor S2 are found in a resolved closed set store, and this is now an important part of the algorithm, because you need to avoid redundancy and to keep the node count in the graph always unique, to have a store, which I call here LCS, where you store the already resolved closed sets and their BDDs. So if neither S1 nor S2 are found in the LCS, call yourself recursively first with S1, then with S2, forming left result and right result respectively. Otherwise, call yourself only for the closed set which is new and return the BDD stored for the other. Finally, form the final result from the closed set S' prime and the left result as well as the right result. Here is the final resolution tree or FPDD which is as compact as possible. We can actually show, and this has been already done in the first paper, Constructive Patterns of Logical Truth, that such trees are always near to optimal. My algorithms are actually two approximation algorithms of the NP-complete problem in FBDD. That's the end of this video. I hope you got something out of it, aiming that it helps making your life much easier when you read one or more of my published work. Thank you and have a good time.